Wherever there are shadows, there are people ready to kick at the darkness until it bleeds daylight. This is Bleeding Daylight with your host, Rodney Olson. Welcome to Bleeding Daylight. Please share this episode with others. You can find other episodes and links to our Facebook, Instagram and Twitter pages at bleedingdaylight.net. People say that if you do the crime, you do the time. But what happens when society continues to punish offenders long after they've done their time? Today we'll hear from someone who is helping ex-prisoners find purpose, hope and healing. Jarvis Guthrie thought he had his whole life figured out. After graduating high school, he enlisted into the United States Army, while at the same time taking college courses. His plan was to become a computer specialist, but those plans were about to go horribly wrong. Jarvis is my guest on Bleeding Daylight today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me here today, Rodney. You were a young man with great ambitions, but things certainly didn't go to plan. In the years leading up to the time we're talking about, What kind of a young man were you? What were your school years like? My school years were very good. Um, I had good grades. I had everything, but one thing I lacked was God. I was very talented in sports. I played football, basketball, track. I was brought up in a a good home. Um, My dad did 20 years in the military, and uh, my mom, um, she's Scottish. So I was actually born in Scotland, and we came over here when I was one years old. So it sounds like family life was good, everything was heading in the right direction, so you had no reason to believe that these plans that you were making about joining the forces, about becoming a computer specialist, weren't going to happen. So what went wrong? I would say the the absence of a spiritual father, because we think we are right in our own eyes. So I was very prideful. Um, I was very arrogant. I thought that I was the one doing all this without giving any um, glory to God. So God had to humble me. So here you are, a man who is very sure of yourself, very sure of the direction that your life is going to take, and, and you had mapped it out in your mind. But there was an incident that brought that crashing down. Tell me about that incident. When I had my first son, James Guthrie, when I was 16 years old, and I seen him, and he was the most precious thing I ever seen in my life. That's when I decided to follow in my father's footsteps and join the military rather than playing college football. My son was born in November, and I enlisted into the, the Army December of 2011. And January of 2012, uh, my life changed forever. On the night of January 21st of 2012, I ended up breaking into a police officer's house. That doesn't sound like a particularly smart thing to do, to break into a police officer's house. But at the time, you didn't know that it was a police officer's house, did you? No, sir, I did not. I had so much to drink that night. I barely remember that whole night. The last thing I remember was sitting down um, on the sofa, too drunk to drive. And I remember that I tried to get back into my car several times. My friends, they didn't let me drive. They took my keys. And before you knew it, I was down the street banging on the door of this house. I remember waking up into the emergency room. My head was hurting. It was swelling. I couldn't open um, one of my eyes. And the um, deputy sheriff said, "Um, boy, you are lucky to be alive. You just tried to break into a police officer's house. And I was just blown away of how I got here, why I, why I got here, and just trying to piece everything back together from that night was totally impossible because I was so drunk on top of being pistol whipped in the head. It caused me to have short memory loss. I suffered a concussion as well that night. As far as you can understand, what was going on for you? Were you just trying to get into a house and you picked the wrong one? Was there any intent to actually break in and and rob? Or what do you think was going on? As you say, you were too drunk to really know what was going on. But what do you think was your initial intent at that time? I think I I went outside to probably smoke a cigarette and I probably got the houses confused. Probably went to the house because it was only four houses across the streets. I didn't wander off too far. 
I've never been in trouble before. I had my whole life ahead of me. I was very proud to be able to be, you know, enlisted in the United States Army. I was very proud to um, be able to take care of my family. So I want to jeopardize my life, or my freedom, or my future to rob this police officer. That was not my intentions. And then, of course, came the court case. And it would seem that it would be a, a very simple case, but that wasn't what happened. What went on with this court case? So I was incarcerated for 13 days in the local jail before my, my dad got the money for the lawyer and bonded me out. And I remember during those 13 days that this was not the life I wanted to live or be in. Um, it was an experience I, I don't want any individual to ever have to go through. The biggest thing that really opened my eyes, there were individuals that were being offered time, like two years and five years, and they were actually taking the trial and they were losing in, in trial and coming back to the dorm and receiving longer sentences, 20 years, 25 years. That's all I needed to see. So once I got bonded out of jail, um, I fought my case for eight months. And my lawyer got, you know, the community to write letters. People spoke on, on my behalf. And I thought I was still going to be able to go to the Army. Um, I was still in school to make sure I finished up my college credits. I was in four classes. Um, so I was still proceeding to, you know, leave for the Army. And on May 25th was my ship date. And I was unable to leave. Here comes August, um, seven months later, and I had two options. I could either plead mercy or take it to trial. So I decided to plead mercy to the courts, and um, that's when I got my sentence of two years in prison and three years of house arrest, and I was charged with burglary and assault to an occupied dwelling. So even at this time when it's becoming obvious that your life has radically changed, there is still some of this young man's arrogance in thinking that this is all going to be over and I'm going to continue my life just as I had planned it to be. And yet that wasn't the case at all. You're sentenced. You enter into incarceration. Tell me about that. What were those first few days like as you started to think, this is where I am for the months ahead? My first day in prison, it scared, it scared me to death. I remember getting off the bus and having to strip down, squat my legs, open my butt cheeks and cough right next to about 30 other men. And I remember how the correction officers treated us. They would slap us, beat us, spin on us. And if you had like a, a sexual charge, you would get beat terribly bad by the correction officers and the other people in prison. So I was really exposed to a lot of horrible things, a lot of inhumane things. And I remember just my first time being in the cell. It was so small. It was so hot. There was no air condition. I just began to really cry out to God and to begin to seek him because I've always been driven and ambition, but I began to really seek what my purpose in life is. If it wasn't the military I must have a greater purpose from God. So that's when I really um, started turning my attentions to God and reading the Bible and getting more involved with going to church and things of that nature. So had you had any kind of faith background before that, or was it these circumstances that made you reach out for just something? I grew up in church, but I never grew in Christ. I knew how to sing hymns, but I never knew him. A church bus used to come pick us up. We would get on the church bus. They would throw us candy. And we would sing this little light of mine. But I had no idea um, who God was. It was more of a routine or a, a good feeling for the day. But it was not relationship-based. So here you are in this prison. And it sounds like a, a terrible, terrible place to be. You've got no privacy. You've got no respect from anyone in there. And so you're trying to reach out. And I guess this is where that sort of arrogance of youth and, and that self-assuredness starts to, to fall away. As you start to cry out for God, did you hear some kind of answer from him? Did you get some sort of signal that, yes, I'm here with you? I got sentenced to prison August 
30th of 2012. And in nine months of May 13, 2013, that's when I got my calling. But during those nine months of me seeking God, that's when I began to really see how blessed I was and how really fortunate I was to have a good foundation with my parents, to have a, a great support system, because I was able to see that you know a lot of individuals didn't have what I had. My mother used to write me every week and send pictures and send money. And I began to really see the value of life, what really is important. And he began to pull on me. I learned how to give. So my mother would give me $20 a week and I would be able to give $2, which was my tithes to individuals who didn't have it. And I just really seen the need to love on people and, and to give whatever I could. That was kind of like my birth. You know, it was my birth into ministry, into God. And once I began picking up the Bible, it was like being at a movie premiere and seeing the glory of God. It was the most amazing thing I've seen. Um, There's nothing like prison ministry because you're able to see God's forgiveness, God's mercy, God's love inside of the walls because there's no difference between people in prison and people outside the walls. You can be free on the outside, but you can still be trapped in the inside. I was just able to really discover who I was and what I wanted to do with my life, and that was to serve our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and to help people. And he just put me through a lot of different tests and a lot of different obstacles um, during those nine months. And um, leading up to those nine months, um, at night, I couldn't breathe. I couldn't talk. It was almost like somebody had their their hands against my throat. And when I began to really go to church and ask these questions, I remember her name was Gail Kirkland. She told me that I was in spiritual warfare and I needed to pray and fast because the enemy wants me dead. And so little confirmations like that, being able to put two and two together, it just kept me going. It fueled me into a direction for God. So when I began to pray and fast, it was life changing. May 10th of 2013, I went on a three-day fast, and it was just the most transformational thing I've ever experienced. It felt like I was sinless. It felt like I was pure. It felt like I was walking on water. It felt like God picked me up as a father would pick up his child to comfort him and to love him. And that's when he called me into the ministry, and he really spoke to me. And I remember that day like it was yesterday. And the word came to me saying, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. So God didn't say, hey, Jarvis, you're a pastor. Hey, Jarvis, you're a preacher. When I seen that scripture, Ephesians chapter six, verse 19, I knew what he was saying. And it took me being in prison to accept my calling, because if God would have spoke to me when I was a free man, I would have ran from God because when I got that that scripture, I ran on my top bed. I was so scared. I was like Jonah, you know, trying to escape on what get what God had for me because I thought that God was going to say, "Hey Jarvis, I want you to be a doctor, be a lawyer, be a you know construction builder." I had no idea He wanted me to be a preacher. I can't I can't describe that moment. It was just everything to me, and just being in my cell. Once I realized that. I was going to be a preacher. Well, I am a preacher. I better start memorizing verses. So I would prance around the room like a lion in a cage, and I will put up scriptures on the wall to memorize them. And then I got bolder. Then I would begin to tell people about the Lord. And I just seen the urgent need of spreading God's word because there was a lot of people who did not know God. See, God is for everybody but everybody's not for God. And just being able to see uh, what I experienced in two years, it was life-changing. It changed my whole destiny. It changed my lifestyle. It changed who I was as a person. It changed my perspective of, of the world. It changed my perspective of what it really means to be a Christian. I can imagine that there would be a couple of different types of people within the prison. There would be people like yourself who realized that life can't continue to go on the way that it has. You've been humbled and you're now reaching out and saying, okay, 
what next? And and for you, thankfully, it was meeting Jesus Christ. But for others, there would be this ongoing bravado, this I don't need what you're pushing on me. I, I don't need any of this. I'm, I'm still self-sufficient. Is that correct? Is that the sort of thing that there would be some people that would be further hardened by prison, that they would want even less to do with God? A- absolutely. You know, coming to prison for two to four years is nothing when I can go back on the streets and sell dope, make $50,000 at a time, you know, selling crack cocaine. So some of the men thought that this was just a timeout for protection. And then once I get out, I can go back to selling dopes. You know, I'll be stronger this time. I won't make those same mistakes. And there was a lot of great people that, you know, stopped thinking about returning back to that lifestyle. You know, I've met some of my, my best friends from being incarcerated and we follow each other on social media and we still talk to this day. It's been, oh my gosh, eight years since I've been released from prison. So yeah, there's definitely two people that's in prison. One that turns to God and one that rejects God. And tell me about that prison ministry that goes on there. Those people that come in and hold those church services. What's that like when they come in and I guess are bringing a a breath of fresh air into into a place that is difficult and hard. It is so rewarding. We're able to make relationships with these volunteers. And God had this lined up for me. Um, so I actually met Roderick Pinckney, and he came into Lake City Correctional Facility as a volunteer. And after some time that he spent with us, I felt a divine relationship, and he became my pastor. And I've been under his wing since 2013. So I've known him nine years. I still go to his church. He's the one that's my spiritual father. He's the one that teaches me, that trains me. I was fortunate enough to go to at least five church services throughout the week and to see different walks of life and to get different, you know, wisdom and knowledge and to get just a relationship, you know, and it was so key to us. We look forward to it. Uh, Whatever day you had church service, you you looked towards that day because these volunteers came in and loved on us and told us things that pertains to God. So the scripture that changed my life was when Pastor Roderick Pinckney said, son, as a man thinks in his heart, so he becomes. That was the renewal of my mind right there. As a man thinks in his heart, so he becomes. And he told us that, hey, even though you're in prison, you're still a child of God. You can still be successful. Eight years later. Now I go back into the prisons. I've been doing prison ministry now for a year and a half. So you have this opportunity to to speak into the lives of those young men who are in that prison. But at the same time, of course, we're talking back in that time when you were imprisoned and you finally come to that release time. And there must have been a sense that now I can get on with my life. But you found the reality to be somewhat different, that while you were ready to wipe the slate clean and you had paid your time, not everyone else was, were they? No, sir, not at all. So I was released April 2nd of 2014, and that was a Wednesday night. And my first day out of prison, I was in church. It was so amazing. Um, I beat my pastor to the church, <laughs> and he, he came right before me. and He brought me a Greek concordance. And also a Bible, that's something I requested. And it was just so amazing being able to testify, you know, what the church was doing and what God was doing in my life. At their church, um, I got enrolled into college four days later to continue my, my education at the college. And when I started looking for jobs, I never knew this world existed. Um, growing up, I heard, you know, people did go to prison and people became convicted felons. But I never knew the anguish and the pain that it causes because it's discrimination with housing, with employment, and also education. You know, once you become a felon, in some states here in the United States, all of your rights are stripped. You can't vote. You can't run for public office. You know, you can't get certain certificates or trades or licenses to further your life. So they still can find you when you're labeled as a convicted felon, because nobody wants to hire you. Nobody wants you working for them. It really broke my heart, especially going to probation offices and checking in 
um, because I still had three years of house arrest. And just seeing um, my brothers and sisters go back to prison, I told God that I wanted to do something about this because life is precious. You know, these are some great people who can't catch a break. You know, some people can't handle rejection. Some people can't handle no. Some people just give up and go back to doing what they want to do because they're not given the opportunities as somebody with a clean record would. Um, I started a nonprofit in 2018 to help. I'm in transition from prison, but it's been really hard trying to get grants. You got to have capital funding to obtain that for a nonprofit. And it wasn't until my dad died in 2019 um, that I inherited some property. And when I went down there to do his funeral arrangements, my two aunts, Aunt Kat and Aunt Jean, took me to um, the farm. And they told me that, you know, I own half, <clears throat> half of the 60 acres. And that's when the light bulb really went off for me. For the past two years, I've been land clearing and getting the 60-acre farm ready to start rehabbing the house. So we're going to do a reentry program for men getting out of prison so they won't have to have the issues um, that they're dealing with. So we're going to provide free housing. We're going to provide relationships with the men and also employment opportunities uh, we're going to start a box truck business called Second Chance Logistics, and I'm I'm very thankful for that. From 2014 to 2019, when I was trying to get my nonprofit going, I was running my dad's semi trucking business, and we had um, four semi trucks. So I do have a semi trucking background. Everything that I've been through the past ten years is just preparing me to launch this ministry. So not only did I go to prison. But I lost my mom in 2016. Then I lost my brother to mental illness. He's a military veteran with PTSD, and he committed a murder in 2017. Then 2019, my father died. So I've been tested with this purpose and with this vision. And because of my love for God and my faith and my love for helping people, I kept pressing on. So when I was a, a young person playing sports, perseverance and endurance, it really it really helped me, plus God's grace to be able to, to handle these things and go through these things. It sounds like life has continued to be difficult, and yet you're really approaching it differently now in that you're no longer that young man who was sure of himself and was going to just go ahead and conquer the world. But now your focus has turned to others. And I can imagine for those young men who are in prison, who are released just as you were and try to find work just as you did, and yet they keep getting rejected, it's no wonder that so many of them then say, well, if this world is not prepared to give me a second chance, I will go back into the things that I used to do. I will commit more crime. And, and again, our prisons become fuller and fuller. Tell me about the support that you're getting now that you have this wonderful idea of using this farmland and actually helping others rehabilitate. Who's coming alongside you to give you support to see this become a reality? Wow. A lot of people, my family, my church, ex-employers, people that see what I'm doing on LinkedIn, social media. Um, there's been a lot of people who's helped in so many ways, either with their time with their talents or with their treasure. Um, I know starting off, I won't be able to do this, you know, by myself. You know, a vision is bigger than you. This is not about me. My story is for God's glory. When somebody knows your heart and knows your intentions and knows your calling, you know, God will e equip you with the resources and with the people for you to, to carry out this vision. So we're getting really close to start building so our first year, we'll be able to house six men. And in the state of Florida, it costs nearly $40,000 in taxpayers' dollars to incarcerate an individual. So by having six men on the farm a year, that will save taxpayers $240,000. And I would like to say that the unemployment rate for ex-offenders is at 27%. And that right there is higher than any historical period, including the Great Depression. It's costing so much money to incarcerate individuals 
this to me is modern day slavery to make a profit off a of crime because here in the United States, it's costing over a hundred billion dollars to keep roughly 2.3 million people behind bars on top of like our families who send money and commissary. That's almost three billion dollars. And what's so alarming is it's a revolving door. Like recidivism is supposed to decrease, but it's increasing. So within five years, 80% of people who are released from prison are going back. So just think about it. If 100,000 people are released this year, 80,000 people will return within five years. That's a lot of money that we're wasting on in- incarceration that we could use elsewhere, like orphans, the homeless, to pay our, our teachers a decent salary. We just need to continue to shed light in darkness. You know, this is like a slaughterhouse. People are in prison in inhumane conditions. We're not getting rehabilitated. Once we get out of prison, we have no resources. Or if we do have resources, we're very limited. Then within a certain amount of time, we're going back to prison. This is a never ending circle. So I would like to say thank you for every person who supports reentry programs. Thank you to every person that hires ex offenders because God is generational. We are changing the generation of one man by giving this individual the simple things of life, a job, a house, his purpose, and love. Do you think that we need to change community attitudes towards people who've been incarcerated? Because so often there's this sense of they've made a mistake and therefore I'm going to write them off for the rest of their life. And that's obviously wrong because we all make mistakes and and most of us are not making the sorts of mistakes that will lead us to prison, but we all know that we all fail and yet we don't give so many people that same right to fail and then get their life back on track. How do we start to change community attitudes towards people who have been imprisoned? I would say, for example, when my farm is up, up and running, I would love to have the community and employers to come to our farm and sit down and talk about some of these issues. You know, this is not a white issue. This is not a black issue. This is a God issue. You know, they need to understand who we are. We're just men and women. And I would love, for example, like wardens and judges and politicians to be able to spend, say, a day inside of prison. And when they get out of prison, spend a day as a as an inmate, you know, have effect social security and have these charges of sex crimes, of violent crimes and see how far they get. So until they experience what we experience, they won't understand until it happens to them. But we need to break the barriers down by just noticing that we are people. If I killed somebody 20 years ago and I'm getting out of prison and I don't have a place to stay and I don't have a job, that's anger and rage that's boiling inside of that person. If we're not helping people get out of prison, our communities are not going to be safer. We need to be able to not look at the charge and look at the person. We need to love the person and hate the sin. We need to love the person and hate the spirit. If we love the people, we might see salvation. But how can people put judgment upon us? They're putting judgment back on themselves double. There needs to be less discrimination and less judgment. Once we realize why that person committed that crime and we're able to deal with the root problem, oh, that person was robbing because he didn't have a mom and dad and he was in poverty trying to feed his sister. We're not trying to give excuses, but for every choice we make, there's a reaction, a reason why that choice was made, good or bad. So once we identify why people commit these crimes and provide solution for them, that's how our communities will be better. It's not only helping those people, but it's helping the wider society because you're not paying to keep people behind bars when there is the possibility that they can lead fruitful lives and actually build into our society rather than just take from it by being incarcerated long term. And I suppose that's the message that you're wanting to get out to people. 
Amen. Absolutely. Just think about in the United States, there's been a shortage of truck drivers. Now, what if these 650,000 men that are being released every year, that's our pipeline from prison to employment. These are great people, great talents. If you love somebody coming out of prison and you give them the opportunity, they'll be the most loyal person ever. But washing dishes for a living, that's a great starter job, but that's not where we want to finish. Think about out of 650,000 people who will love to drive trucks, you know, here in the United States because there's a, you know, a shortage in truck drivers, you know? So we need to look past the charge and past the crime and see the heart and see what the individual can do with the second chance. Not all people are bad. If people are wanting to find out more about this amazing project that you're undertaking with this farmland and the buildings that are just about ready to go, where's the easiest place for them to find you? Um, The easiest place to find me is through LinkedIn and also my email address, which is saybygraceministries at outlook.com, or you can give me a a call. I do have WhatsApp, so I'm able to have international calls because I do have family over in Scotland. So social media or give me a call. Um, We'd love to talk more um, about how to get involved with with the ministry and also helping ex-offenders. Well, I will certainly put links into the show notes at bleedingdaylight.net so that people can find out more about this amazing work that you're doing, how you've taken a terrible thing that happened with you back in the day and you're turning it around for the sake of so many others. I want to thank you for what you're doing there and I want to wow. thank you for spending time with me today on Bleeding Daylight. Yes, it was it was amazing. Um, I, I want to start preaching. I think you did a great job as a facilitator. You are a very passionate professional. I can hear it in your voice. Thank you for giving people opportunities to shed light into darkness, brother. I've been following you now since I've been connected with you. And these are some amazing people that's coming on your, on your podcast. So I feel honored and humbled to be here today. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to Bleeding Daylight. Please help us to shine more light into the darkness by sharing this episode with others. For further details and more episodes, please visit bleedingdaylight.net.